Factor Show. Episode 163. Sponsored by Taylor Freelance, Rainier Ballistics, Hodgson Powders, and JPL Precision. Hey everyone, welcome to Power Factor. I'm Columbia. This is my jacket. And this is my name. Hey, Rick. Actually, it's Steve and John as usual. Yeah, as usual. John as usual. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least your name yeah. is on yours. So. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. So today we're going to talk about the um, Breda 680, I'm going to call it the 680X line of shotgun series um, of products. We've kind of, the idea here is kind of somewhat of a, a shotgun review episode, but I thought rather than doing like what we did before on the A300 of specifically talking about the individual gun, we're going to talk about the 686, the 682, which is what um, I shoot, and then the 692. And John, yeah. you just got the 692 yeah. last year, right, last right August. when they first came out. Um, my 682, mm-hmm. I got mine two years ago, right, literally right when they ended. I think they they terminated them about mm, about a year later. No, it was actually a couple months oh, yeah? uh, after I got mine, and then there was this blank spot where you couldn't really get anything okay. other than what was in the pipeline, and then the 692 came out. So. So I think that's kind of what we're going to just discuss here, the pros and cons. I shouldn't say the pros and cons, but the differences between each of the guns. Um, and yeah, I'm smiling because I, I did the transfer for Steve when he got his true. gun. Yeah. And I had mine, <laughs> I don't know, for a while before that, six months before that or Yours something like that. The, the, the 686. The, right. So when when he came over and got it, it was like, okay, what this the other what, two what grand? For, yeah, what is what, what is two, two grand, grand, get grand you? buy you? Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if that's kind of what we want to do here or not. Start with Probably a basic. Probably not so much gun. that, but I just just uh, bottom to the top okay. of really what the differences are, um, okay. rather than focusing really on the price. I mean, yeah, we, we will talk about but, price I mean, you difference. Know, and, because you start with a basic gun, and then what do you get on top right, of that? Right. So why don't you start with the with the basic, since that one is yours. The basic. Uh, all three of these guns back here are sporting guns. They're all 32 inch barrels. They're all 12 gauge. They're op- they're some form of an Optima barrel, mm-hmm. which for Beretta, that's their big bore. It's uh, like a 732 bore compared to like 725 for your basic 12 gauge. Right. Uh, it does not have an adjustable trigger on it. You can't move the trigger up or back on the trigger bar, so mm-hmm. I hope you like the reach on it. Mm-hmm. The barrels, as you can see... Well, do, the reach can be changed by obviously modifying, I mean, cutting yeah. the stock or adding well, to it. Well, that's different. No, right. that's, that's like the pull. I'm talking oh, reach. I'm sorry, you're talking reach that reach. For okay, finger. got it. Uh, the barrels are not ventilated between right. the upper and the lower. Uh, it does not have replaceable shoulders on the barrel like the other guns do, which Beretta would say... Uh, it's a really neat feature, but no, we've never replaced any anyway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the wood is not as high a grade of wood as on some of the other guns. Mm-hmm. Uh, this gun did not come with extended chokes. I had to buy those separately. Okay. And uh, you know, other than that, it's a Beretta shotgun. Right. Right. So, and it does have the mid bead, which is another characteristic mm-hmm. of all the, um, the, the sporting sporting guns. Sporting guns. Uh, that's interesting in the chokes because I thought, generally speaking, and this may have changed when you got the gun to where they are now, but I thought that the sporting guns all came with five chokes, but that may no, not be I, the case. I, well, it came with five chokes, but they were flush. Flush chokes, okay. And I all believe right. that the SP1s, the Silver Pigeon 1s, mm-hmm. are flush choke also. also. Okay. And then okay. you get Silver Pigeon 2, and then into the 682s and the 687s, right. they'll come with extended chokes. Right. And, ne- and that would be the next step is technically the 687, which neither of us own, but I was actually looking before I got my gun. I was looking at actually going to 687. The 687 primarily is nicer wood, nicer engraving, yep. but that's really about it in terms of the difference. Uh, they got ventilated barrels. Not in this, well, they, so, they some didn't models when I do. got mine. Okay. Some yeah. models do. Yeah. You know, I was looking at the Joel Etchen all around gun. Right, right. Before I bought this. Mm-hmm. And 
it wasn't that different than what I have. It, it was a 687 receiver mm -hmm. with 682 barrels mm -hmm. and with what they call their E-E-L-L or double-E-double-L. -E yeah, which is wood, a really nice wood. Really nice wood yeah. with a parallel stock. Right. And it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of a Monte Carlo stock. Yeah. And to me, that gun looks more like a trap gun than it would work for, say, Skeeter Sporting Plays. Sporting place. gun, yeah. 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 And, and I, I didn't look at that as much of a step up over the technology that I had. Right. That's why I started to look at the 692 because mm -hmm. that, that was just what had come out right. and it's got a bunch of changes and differences in it over what the 682 is. Mm -hmm. So why don't you talk about your 682 okay. now. Okay. So you guys have seen this before, but this is the Breda 682. Um, the 682 is no longer in Breda's product catalog. It started out in 1985 is when they first came out. Um, just to get a little bit technical here, in, in 80, from 85 to 95 they have what's referred to as a narrow receiver and a wide receiver. And in 95, they came out with, now is what is called the narrow receiver. Um, I'm not really sure what the attempt of all of that was. I don't know if it was weight to the weight, Maybe. yeah, lighten the thing up, um, I, I don't know. But this is the 682, what was called the gold E or gold evolution. Um, it has nicer wood over the standard 686. It has, this particular one has a really high gloss. Um, I don't know if you can see it here, but the high gloss. Um, it's blinding. Yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> um, finish to the stock. Which you just love. Which I'm, to be honest, not really a big fan of. And, uh, it, and some people really love it. Um, you have to really be careful in terms of, of dents or dings or whatever. And I don't really have any in here except for one that I put in here stupidly when I broke my first 25 and held the gun over my head and went, ah, like they do in the Olympics <laughs> when they win. And I forgot that I pulled the hole out and was holding it in my hand and grabbed the gun like this when I did it and put a dent in the stock. But I guess I can at least say, you know, hey, every time I see that, it's, I remember my, my first 25 straight and it's, skeet. It's used. Yeah. Uh, has the ventilated rib uh, that John was talking about before in the barrel, or, the, or I should say the, the, the ventilated the, barrel. The mid -rib right, between the, mid -rib. the barrels. Um, again, has the mid B that's characteristic on all the sporting guns. Came with five extended uh, chokes. The 682 has the um, what John was talking before about is the replaceable shoulders. Now, basically, what that is, there's a screw here that you can replace the shoulders as the gun. I, I would say wears, wears in. See, I, I always thought that the replaceable shoulder yeah. was the back half but where not. the pins yeah. go in. Because right. if you take a look at one of these actions after a while, the those holes that the pins, the the locking lug, mm -hmm. the bolt goes into, they begin to flare a little bit. So what John's talking about is these holes right here and the, here. They'll begin to flare a little bit, especially at the bottom where those those pins go in. And I was thinking, well, well, that's a wear point, so right. so that would be what you replace. No, it's, it's the front not. part. It's the yeah. front part, so John, which is it's which, this part right here, and you can see the screw head right there, kind of, and that it's the front part of this whole entire assembly, which is the part that you replace. And, and what's interesting is that that is another lockup point, which is right here. That's another lockup point for when the action is closed. You've got contact at the trunnions right. up in here. Right. You've got the pins going in it. There will be contact usually at the top of the receiver on the face of the receiver. You'll mm -hmm. see those marks on the barrel. But there's also contact in this area of mm -hmm. the receiver from that replaceable right. shoulder. And that makes it just really solid. And, and speaking of, of basically what you can replace, the nice thing about the Berettas is that as it wears in, maybe at about the 100,000 round about point, there, yeah. you can replace the um, ba the, the, the locking. The U-bolt. Yeah, the U-bolt, uh, which are the pins that extend from the mechanism into the barrels. Uh, with the next size larger. And you can also, if you need to, if it's sloppy in the hinge pin here, you can replace the trunnions with one size larger. And then after another 100,000 rounds. Or at the first 100, you just swap sides on the trunnions. Yeah, I've heard that before. Um, and then there's, basically what I'm getting at is there's three different sizes here. Yeah. And it's probably not unusual for one of these guns to run a half a million rounds, oh, possibly, yeah. or even more. Yeah. 
Um, having a, basically an overhaul, if you will, is about two to three hundred dollars give or like take. That. Yeah. yeah. So it's Tighten not. It up. Yeah. It's. I mean, you're. You know, it's very inexpensive. Uh, it's. You know. You, you. Yes, you may end up paying a bit for the gun up front, but in terms of the longevity and and just you know. Uh, maintenance and whatnot it's 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 pretty cheap and pretty easy and as it does get worn in um, the you know it, it's it's pretty easy to go ahead and it's not something we, you would do yourself and not unless you're really confident but no. um, you send it to Coles that, and that's worth the money yeah to have them do yeah. it um, the the intent of the 682 was really a kind of a low-end competition uh, entry-level shotgun and there are a lot of people actually who have done very well with these things at a high level of competition I think Dan Carlisle for quite some time was shooting a 682, um, and then moved on to the DT-10, and then now the DT-11. Um, when I got this, the DT-10 was bred as high-end competition gun, um, but I'm really happy with it. It's it's worked out very well for me. Um, it now we just weighed these things, and this one's seven pounds, thir 14 ounces. We'll call it that. Mm -hmm. uh, your Onyx was, I think, eight three or eight, eight four. Eight two. Eight two. Okay. Eight two eight three. Right. And the 692 is like eight four. But the 692, well, both of my guns have kick ease pad on them. And before I put the kick ease pad on mine, with all of the balance weights in it, it was right at uh, 715, I think. Okay. And one other comment here I wanted to make real quick is that John talked about the fixed trigger you were saying yes. before. The 682 has an adjustable trigger and actually an adjustable trigger face. So that you can take this trigger off. The shoe itself. The shoe, though, so the trigger here itself can be unscrewed and taken off, and you can put a different one on that has the trigger canted out to the right for a right-handed shooter. I and prefer I believe a there's three, three different slots on the They're, bar, right. so you can pick what position yeah. fits the reach of your hand. Right. It's right. a little bit more adjustability to fit you. Yeah, so it's not trigger, I'm sorry, it's not length of pull that you're adjusting, you're really adjusting the, the position of your finger on the trigger where you grip the pistol grip of the shotgun itself mm -hmm. so yeah so what beretta did after the 682 is they changed a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. and the 692 has some styling cues that are similar to the dt11 right the, the style of the receiver is pretty much like the the DT11. Uh, I think the checkering patterns on both of our guns are pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. And the four ends are pretty much the same. 692 does have the same adjustable trigger on the trigger bar. Uh, it has like a an overmold rubber overlay on the lever. Which I'll be a I admit I'm not a fan of that, um, but I know a lot of oh, guys like it when it, your fingers get so, sweaty. It's so soft. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the barrels, from the outward appearance, are the same as a 692 barrel, but these are, but not I inside. Believe, they call them Stelium, Stelium. or Stelium Plus. Yeah. Uh, the DT-11s have 19 inches of forcing cone in them, compared to about your normal... Uh, 12 gauge is going to have like a two to three inch, which is a generous forcing cone in it. Yeah, yeah. This gun has 14 inches. Okay. And it's more of a taper than a cone itself. Uh, it came with five extended chokes, mm -hmm. and these are uh, Optima HPs. Right, where mines are Optimas, right? And I, th I think they are a little bit longer. And so I think the transition from bore diameter down to choke diameter is not as I don't know what the word is, sudden. Mm -hmm. It's over a little bit more time. Right, right. Uh, this also has a wider receiver, and that right. may be where some of the weight difference is. Uh, it also has beefier ejectors, and they are much bigger than the ejectors that are in the 682. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're also adjustable. You can turn, basically or turn a screw. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. You, can, right, you can turn from ejectors to extractors. To extractor. Right. And uh, which they, is nice. I mean, if you, if that if that's a concern, and an interesting point is that we had somebody actually write us in the program and asked, how can I convert my 686 extract, sorry, ejectors, extractors? To, so yeah, yeah, ejectors extract, and get to, backwards yeah. right. And basically, what the information I've read is one of two things. You can the cheap way is go and try to cut some quills out of the. Um, out of the, the, the spring. springs um, that fire it, and that may kind of work, but the real way is going in and really changing <clears throat> effectively the sear, if you will, in the yeah. fore end um, so it doesn't fire it. Another difference 
is in the forehand itself, and I don't know if you can see this, uh, that there is a spring down inside the forehand iron, which keeps spring pressure on the iron, the barrel, and the receiver, and keeps it locked up tighter uh, for longer. Right, right. What else is different? It comes with a weight system. Mm -hmm. There is a, a hollowed out area in the stock that has a series of seven tenths of an ounce weights that uh, are in there and you can remove them, add to them to get it to balance the way you want it to. And this thing balances right between the the trunnions and the black the of the four iron. iron. Yeah. 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 So it's it's real neutral. Right. It's not barrel barrel heavy at all. Your gun isn't either. No. Um, in fact I think mine balances the same point, if you will, that yours and we'll check here but so yeah, right about, in there. right about the same yep. spot, maybe a little bit forward, but yeah. not much. Yeah, and, and, the, uh, and mine actually has a hollowed out. I mean, you know, where the bolt goes through for the um, stock, you can get a roll of quarters or dimes or oh, nickels you, or whatever. You know, yeah, I mean, you could do you it. It's just it. not yeah. the fancy system that Brett has put into yeah. the 692. Right. Yeah. Now, in terms of shootability or comparing your 686 to the 692, what did you notice? I noticed that I don't think it kicks as much. Okay. And I think that's because of uh, the taper in the barrels. Mm -hmm. You shot it and you didn't think there was much difference at all. Uh, yeah, when I, we did the test back to back between the 682 and the 692. Um, and at that time we didn't know the weight of the guns either. Yeah. Uh, but I took the exact same load. I took my loads and shot them through mine and then shot them through yours. And to me, it actually, and this is going yeah, to well, be- Yeah, well, it's all yeah. subjective. Um, to a certain degree, except we had an observer who pointed out that he thought, based on what an apparent recoil, your gun kicked more than mine. And that's the way, it, to me, it that, felt like your gun kicked. That's an excellent point, too. Yeah. Because you have the Beretta yeah. pad on your right, gun, right. and I have Kiki's pads on my guns. The Beretta pad that came on the 692 is at least flat, if right. not convex. Right. And I couldn't stand the thing, yeah. because the gun would move around. I yeah. could not get a consistent mount with it. And that might have something to do with the movement that and you saw. The movement felt. and also just perceived recoil. I mean, yeah. the fact that it did not fit. Yeah. I mean, if you're saying that the back of it is flat as opposed to concave, mine is going to, you know, contour to your shoulder yeah. pocket more than a flat or one. Or convex. Will, so, I right, mean, it was right, almost like a rocker. Yeah, 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 on yours. Yeah. Right, mine's concave, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, yeah. So, again, so. it's an interesting point that now you have changed the recoil pad. It might be interesting to yeah. go and do that experiment again sometime. What, what I notice is, is that a little bit... And uh, I think a pattern's really tight. I've mm -hmm. been shooting uh, Continental at good distances with a modified choke mm -hmm. and crushing them. Yeah, yeah, I've so. seen that. And I have not tried modified on Continental, but I typically always go with improved modified. Yeah. Uh, so it'd be interesting sometime to try just a modified out yeah. on that and see how that works out compared so. to that. I have not patterned my gun, and now you patterned yours. I didn't, or you, well, or you, I, I went for point of aim. Okay, so point you aim, not point actually of fired onto paper and, to count and count pellets yeah, and all okay. that junk, no. And actually, we've kind of talked about this before, of doing a choke episode and shotgun patterning, um, and to get put in the technical side of it, there's actually a application out there where you can take, and this is kind of cool, you can take a picture of your pattern and with this software, you can put boundaries on it, and it will go through and figure out basically what your pattern actually is. What the densities are. Yeah, right, yeah. right. So we may actually do that in a future episode at some point of patterning one of the guns and actually using that, taking a picture and using that program to go and do it. Uh, you know, as far as feel, you know, my guns are within a couple of ounces of each other, mm -hmm. and they fit me the same. You know, I, I can just pick them up and I'm on them right. the same. Right. They swing the same. The yeah. balance is real close, so there, there's there's not a lot of difference in the handling characteristics characteristics of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, I just think that there's a little less felt recoil with the 692. And, and that's also an interesting point about you're talking about balance. My Bredis, I'm sorry, Browning Satori that I have actually only weighs a couple more ounces than uh, my feel, 682. Feels like a fence post. But, but where <laughs> the weight is on that is it feels like it's really in the barrels. The gun yeah. just feels nose heavy. Um, the 682 is lighter. But the weight is really more centrally positioned on the gun. It's between the hands, and it, you don't have this sense of just a lot of weight out there getting it moving. Um, and that's one of the nice things. The, the Bretta is just to me, and I've kind of made this, somebody's going to hate me for this comment, 
but to me, a Beretta feels like a sports car, where a Browning feels like you're driving a truck. Just the, the size of the gun, the weight of the gun, the mass of the gun, just the way it feels in your hand feels, to me, just bulky and large. So, the, and the Beretta, because of the, the lockup mechanism not having the lower um, hinge pin, if you will, like the Brownings have, it sets more, more in your hands deeper. The balance is really between your hands, and it just, to me, swings and yeah. feels much much smoother I'm but pretty much the same I, i've had several satori's and they were all nose heavy yeah and yeah. these things they just feel neutral right and they swing right really good they start quick they stop quick yeah so if you were going to recommend a shotgun to uh, somebody entry level coming into it an over under um of in the beretta line we'll just limit it to that what would you recommend it seems to be changing daily. Yeah. Uh, but the ones that are available, probably something like a Silver Pigeon one. Right. And uh, I, it would depend, I think, on what games you wanted to play. True. You want to be a shotgun shooter, you want to be a trap shooter. Right. That's going to get us right. in trouble that, right there. Yeah, yeah. But uh, if you want, like an all around gun, a gun that you can use in a lot of disciplines, mm -hmm. a sporting gun is really hard to beat. Mm -hmm. Uh, Silver true. Pigeon 1 for the money is really hard to beat. Yeah, I would say the same thing. If I was going to recommend an entry or a, a shotgun to anybody who was really starting out who wanted to spend a little more than your average amount of money a couple for a thousand yeah, to twenty twenty two yeah. twenty three hundred dollars. Well, I maybe. thought, and I I should have checked the prices. Yeah, I yeah. should have checked the prices in this. But Joel Etchen, who always, I mean, you and I both got yeah. all of our guns through Joel, um, and their prices typically are probably the lowest out there or if they're not the lowest they're, or they're maybe right there, right there. Yeah. but the thing like we said before with joel etchen is that you also get they will back you up if there are any problems they will make it right um so i, I really test to that yeah recommend going through joel etchen so can i um so i i would probably guess the silver pigeon ones are probably somewhere in around the 1900 dollars. i think so 19, 19, 50, yeah, yeah somewhere in there um, without getting into specifics, um, the 682 at the time, I think, was about $1,500 more or so, give or take, than the 686 yep. or the Onyx, what was available at that time. The 687s were around, I think, 2700 oh, they, they can't just take off. Yeah, they can. Just because of the wood the and the finishes and stuff yeah. and engraving. So the entry-level shotgun, I'm sorry, the entry-level competition 682 at that time was about $3,500 through Joel Etchen. They, their MSRP was considerably higher than that, yeah. but um, for what it's And he worth. had the best prices on 692s also. Right. Like right. 39. Yeah. So I guess you kind of, you know, you got to ask yourself, like John was kind of jokingly coming, so what do you get for, yeah. you know, your $2,000 or whatever? It really depends on, on, you know, what your budget allows and what you're really looking for. Um, I don't regret getting the 682. I don't regret buying this thing yeah. either. Well, why'd you buy that, John? Well, I hadn't yeah. bought a shotgun in a couple of years, <laughs> so it was time. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it's, you know, I'm glad I spent the extra money for what I got. Let's yeah. just put it that way. So um, I, 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 I like that gun a lot. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's, it's safe to say that we're both happy with our, yes. uh, with our purchases. Yeah. But... Yeah, I was. You know, if if you were limited or whatever, I would not hesitate in getting a, a silver pigeon no, one. I think it's a, a great value. They're, they're a good gun. Yeah, they'll last a long time mechanically. They're pretty much the same as any other 680. That's yeah. That's a very good point. And the whole entire 680 the, series mechanically the, are all the same. The big differences are in finishes and quality of wood mm -hmm. and engraving on them. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And, and the packages they put together. And like I say, Beretta is the most confusing marketing <laughs> company I've ever seen yeah. on how they differentiate product. Right, right. So. And, and you made a good point there, is that, and I, I can't prove this, um, but when I was doing the research on the 682, it's like, well, what, how are the 682s different than the 686? I mean, yeah. you know, like we were said, mechanically are the same. Yes, it may have nicer wood, but. You know, that only goes so far. And, and what I had heard is that the, and again, this is back when the 682 and the DT-10 were being built, is that the 682 actually went through the custom shop where those DT-10s were being built. And they did the triggers on those it was so they would actually clean the triggers up and make the triggers a little lighter, if you will. Mm -hmm. Or I shouldn't say lighter, but just smoother in terms of crisper, trigger pull. Cleaner. Crisper, yeah. Not, not you know, um, so much mush or anything yeah. like that. Um, but also they would regulate or verify that the barrels were regulated to a point of aim where the standard production ones that come off the floor, yes, they do fit them to a certain degree, but again, they're a production gun. And I think you've heard pretty much the same thing with the 692 that it came from the DT, 
11 yeah. line. That, um, that the barrels did, at least. I don't know yeah. about the rest of the gun. Yeah, okay. Which has the oil finish. Right. Not the plastic part. Right, yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and probably at some point I may strip that plastic yeah. finish off or have somebody strip it off and do an oil finish on it because if you do dent the wood, it's easy to take the yeah. dents out, yep. um, relatively speaking, by ironing it. So. Hi everybody, welcome to Power Factor. I'm Rick and we got a little segment, another one on a stage design. And it, it was a cool stage. We had our December match at our club and I liked it uh, just in general, but I liked it especially because it illustrates uh, one of the differences uh, that really changes how you can approach IDPA as a competitor. It was a short course of fire, uh, required a minimum of only uh, 10 rounds. And the, w what it featured was uh, a static position that was out in the open where the shooter is surrounded by three threats. And then as the buzzer goes off, You've already got your gun out in this scenario. It's the, the, the scenario, I don't remember exactly how it was worded, but the idea is you're standing essentially holding one of the threats at gunpoint, and the start signal, eh, there's a second threat that's immediately behind you that actually becomes T1. So the idea, I think, behind it was while you're holding one bad guy at gunpoint, his henchman or whatever sneaks up behind you. So when the buzzer goes off, T2, which is the gun you're at, the target you're actually pointing your gun at, is about 15 feet away, and T1 is right behind you, about five feet away. So you have to whirl around to engage T1 first, and that's kind of weird in itself. The idea that you've got this target, and when the buzzer goes off, what you'd like to do obviously is shoot the one you're already pointing your gun at. But because the one behind you is six feet away and the one in front of you is 15 feet away, the one behind you is the more immediate threat. It becomes T1 and you have to engage it first. So that was kind of an interesting wrinkle. We've seen that at a few of, our, a few of the stages at our matches. And I think it's kind of cool and something I haven't seen a lot of. Um, but just consider if you're designing a course of fire, think, of, think you know, out of the box, I guess. And uh, so after the buzzer goes off, you're retreating from the start position while engaging T1, T2, and T3 in tactical priority while moving to the cover of the wall. Now, ideally, the cover position is not going to be necessary for the engagement of T1, T2, and T3. You should be having completed your engagement when you get to the corner of the wall, which in the illustration is I've just uh, called it P2, where uh, if, and then from that cover of P2, you'll engage the last two targets, T4 and T5. Now, where this was kind of interesting is, again, under the old rule book that was in effect prior to October of 2013, if I were shooting this course of fire um, in custom defensive pistol, this is a, a ten, another 10-round 10 course of fire, minimum of 10 rounds. So how you approach it is going to uh, depend to a certain extent on your capacity. So let's say a six-shot revolver, you're absolutely going to want to engage T1, T2, and T3 with only two rounds each, because that'll force an extra reload or a reload where and when you don't want to do it. So you're going to want to be really careful to just use six rounds engaging T1, T2, and T3. If you're shooting an ESP or SSP, you've got 11 rounds in the gun, you've got a little more flexibility. You can burn a round somewhere, pick up a miss, or put an extra round. Let's say by the time you've reached P2, T3 was probably about 15 to 20 yards away. And so if you wanted to put an, an extra round, a makeup round, whatever insurance round, whatever you want to call it, on T3, that might not have been a bad idea. And then you would still have four rounds in your gun for the engagement on T4 and T5. Now, shooting in CDP, the way I would have approached it back in the day, four months ago, I would have fired two at T1, two at T2, two at T3, not wanting to dump rounds now, remember that old rule from three months ago, round dumping, that said you could not fire extra rounds in order to afford a more favorable reloading situation. So what you would have here is, obviously, you also have Vickers scoring that says you can shoot as much as you want to fulfill the requirement. So if you wanted to, you could have fired, say, like the scenario I just uh, went through for anybody who was in ESP or SSP, if you wanted to take an extra shot at T3, that certainly would be justified. Nobody would question taking a third shot while 
engaging T3 on the move while backing up from 15 yards away. I don't think anybody would question that. So if you want to fire an extra shot while you're backing up, that's fine. But you're going to arrive at the edge of cover at P2 with rounds still in your gun. So you're going to fire two. If you, if you have fired six uh, while engaging T1, T2, and T3, you'll still have three rounds in the gun when you arrive at P2. So you'll fire two at T4, one at T5, then you'll have to do a, a slide lock reload before f firing one more round at T5 to complete the engagement. Now a slightly better way to do it, very slightly better, would be to fire a third round at one of those first three targets so that when you arrive at P2, you only have two rounds in your gun. Now you can engage T4 with two, do a slide lock reload, and engage T5 with two. And that saves you having to essentially engage one target twice. In the first scenario, you've got three rounds in the gun, you put two on T4, one on T5, do your reload, and then have to come back to T5. The second scenario, you put one extra round, if you will, on the first engagement, the first array of T1 through T3, you arrive at cover with two rounds in your gun, now you can go T4, two rounds, do your slide lock reload, and engage T5 with two rounds. So you save a little bit of time there um, by doing your reload between targets rather than in the middle of a target. Now, back in the old days, firing that third round, I can't believe anybody would ever call, uh, give you an FTDR for round dumping for firing that, an insurance shot on a target that you're engaging on the move that's 15 yards away. But, possible. Under the new rule book, since October of 2013, round dumping has completely gone away. You can shoot as many rounds as you want, um, no limit, Vickers count. If you want to shoot a target that requires the best two hits, and you want to dump a mag on it, that's fine. That's up to you. Your strategy involves only where and when I want to fire those rounds. Now, essentially what has replaced round dumping as a constraint on what you do is the flat-footed reload. And what that does uh, is forces you to reload without advancing to the next position from which you are going to engage targets. And it's not even really advancing. It's literally movement. If I'm standing at, um, let's say, in this, in this illustration, if, I were going, if, the, if the course of fire were being run in the opposite direction and I started at, at P2 and I was engaging from around that cover position and I wanted to do a reload before I left P2, or I would have to, if I was going to do a reload uh, prior to arriving at the next position where I was going to engage targets, I would have to reload from that very spot. And literally from that spot, the rules say you're allowed to lift one or the other foot and pivot, and it's been related to basketball in the sense that in, if you're familiar with basketball or if you're not familiar with basketball, once you've held the ball, you're allowed to lift one of your feet and pivot on the other one, essentially rotating on the toe or the heel of the other foot. But once you've lifted one foot, the other one has to stay stuck on the ground. You can pivot around it, rotate around it, but you can't lift it off the ground. And so the new reloading rule says you can pick up a foot, you can pivot, but you can't lift the other foot. So that now is kind of the constraint. You don't get any advantage. It used to be you could get an advantage from firing extra rounds because let's say you could reload on the move because you've run your, uh, because you've run your gun dry where you wanted it to. Now you, can't, you don't have that option of reloading on the move, so firing a bunch of extra rounds doesn't really get you anything. You can't go anywhere until that reload is complete. In fact, firing extra rounds might actually hurt. So the other wrinkle is that's been introduced with the new rules is while uh, you are out in the open and moving towards cover if you run your gun dry you can initiate the reload before you arrive at the cover position now that again is a change it used to be you could not reload you could not initiate the reload you couldn't pull the mag out of the pouch you couldn't dump the mag out of the gun until you'd arrived at cover now if you run your gun dry you can initiate that reload as soon as your gun is empty. Now, uh, on this array, three targets, all revolver shooters are going to go two on T1, two on T2, two on T3, and now they're going to initiate their reload. 
so that when, hopefully when they arrive at P2 to engage T4, their gun is already reloaded. And that was always going to, that, that, that's a situation that revolver shooters are going to be very familiar with. I think, you know, we, we, if, when we, if you were shooting IDP in the era of revolver neutrality, where you couldn't have more than six shots required without providing a place to reload, there were often arrays of six targets, and it was very common for revolver shooters to go two, four, six, perform a reload, two, four, six, perform a reload. And in this situation, it's exactly the same. But because round dumping has gone away, Anybody can avail themselves of that similar situation where when you run your gun dry, you can immediately initiate the reload. So now I'm shooting CDP, and if I had shot this course of fire um, back in, say, September, I would have gone two rounds on T1, two rounds on T2, three rounds on T3. I would arrive at position two, put two rounds on T4, perform a slide lock reload, and engage T5 with two rounds, finish the course of fire. Uh, now, with the new rule book that says I can shoot as much as I want and I can initiate my reload in the open, the way I approached this course of fire was to instead go three rounds on T1, three rounds on T2, three rounds on T3. Now I've run my nine round gun dry and I'm still only about halfway between position one and position two. So I do my slide lock reload while I'm moving the rest of the way to P2. I arrive there with a fully loaded gun, or eight rounds in the gun, put two rounds on T4 and two rounds on T5. And so it, you've got a completely different kind of a way you can approach certain courses of fire. The flat-footed reload kind of kills some of your advantages that you had by trying to reload on the move. But then it's sort of replaced by some of these situations where you can reload out in the open while moving if you run your gun dry. And with uh, round dumping off the plate, you can shoot as many rounds as you want. Now, if I, now since it's only a 10-round course of fire, if you're shooting an ESP or SSP, you'll, you'll just approach it conventionally, 2-2-2 two, 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 um, on the first three targets and then two each on the last two with an extra round if you need it. But if you're shooting a revolver, you're, you're still going to shoot it the same way. Uh, 222, two, two, reload while you get to position two. But for CDP shooters, this is kind of an open up this new, uh, a new era of how to approach the courses of fire and just something that you should be aware of that when you have that opportunity, you might actually find yourself in a better situation by firing a few extra rounds to create the more favorable reloading situation that you were essentially banned from doing um, under the old rule books. Ba-dum-bum-bum, 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 ba-